All right, good afternoon. Uh, today's topic is reinforcement learning. I started uh, the course way back when in the, the first lecture. We started almost immediately with this um, uh, one trick of saying um, humans learn sort of on the fly in a world while interacting with the world. Um, but we're going to simplify that by taking the idea of learning offline, right? We're going to, instead of learning all the time and updating all the time and, and constantly changing our model, we're going to look at a data set once, or loop over it, but basically look at it once, produce a model, and that'll be it, and that, that's what we call offline learning, which still is sort of uh, holds most of the challenges of learning but makes the problem a lot simpler. Uh, and basically today we're going to not do that. Reinforcement learning is a setting wherein you actually model an agent inside a world, both interacting with that world, so choosing what to do in the world, getting feedback from the world and learning about the world um, sort of in real time. Uh, so here's an example, for instance, of a case where you might need that. This is a robot vacuum cleaner. Uh, and when the robot vacuum cleaner goes... Uh, is unpacked when you buy it, you unpack it, you put it in your bedroom. Uh, it will see that bedroom for the first time. It's not pre-trained for your bedroom, so it has to learn on the fly to interact with your environment, to find dust, to find a power socket to recharge itself, stuff like that. Uh, so it's a case where this offline learning paradigm is as nice as it is, doesn't really apply. And what we need then is another abstract task. Instead of offline learning, Something like classification, we need reinforcement learning. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll start by simply describing in some detail what the abstract task of reinforcement learning uh, is, what it entails, and giving some examples how to instantiate it, like we did with classification and regression. We just set out what the task, uh, what the ingredients of the task are, and how you instantiate it, how you map a real problem to that task. And we'll look at three approaches to reinforcement learning, three algorithms for solving a task. So, like um, like K nearest neighbors is an, an algorithm for solving the task of classification. Uh, we can solve the task of reinforcement learning by random search, which you've already seen. That's sort of the simplest approach. Policy gradients. Or Q-learning. Those are sort of the three main algorithms. And then after the break, we'll have a look at um, some recent developments, some, uh, some reasons, basically the reasons why reinforcement learning is such a popular topic these days, uh, which is that in 2016, maybe 15, a company called DeepMind created a program called AlphaGo, which uh, beat the then, well, one of the, uh, the world top players in Go at that point, called Lee Sedol. And that was a big surprise to all of us, because at that time, uh, Go was this sort of unbeatable, unbeatable game. We, we didn't, uh, it, it was sort of a, a, a star prize of AI. We didn't really think Go was going to be solved, as we call it, beaten by a, an AI algorithm. Maybe in the next 10 years, so it came as a surprise that, was, that we were this close. So I'll look at uh, how they did that using reinforcement learning. Um, then came an improvement called Alpha Zero, which is worth looking at, so we'll have a look at that as well. And then after it became clear that AlphaGo was properly beaten and had been properly solved, uh, people started thinking about what the next horizon would be. And uh, at DeepMind they chose StarCraft, specifically StarCraft II, as the next game to be beaten, so playing StarCraft to at the level of uh, the top, the world's top human player, would be sort of the next AI milestone. 
Uh, and just a few months ago, DeepMind released Alpha Star. It's not quite clear yet whether it's at human performance or whether it's sort of about or we're starting to reach it. It's not quite clear yet, but we'll have a look at sort of uh, StarCraft in terms of this is the next this is the next horizon, this is what we're working on now. Uh, and that's where we'll end the lecture. So let's get started with reinforcement learning. This is our, uh, our basic framework. It's a bit more complicated than the offline variants. Basically what we have is an environment. We have a model and we have a learner. The learner creates the model uh, and there's not this uh, pipeline from left to right because it happens, uh, the learner updates the model on the fly. Uh, the model takes actions for which it gets an immediate reward and it changes uh, its state, it changes the state of the world. Which basically usually means that this is kind of an agent and it changes where in the world it is. But every time it takes an action, it gets two, po two pieces of information back from the environment. The new state you're in and the reward for the thing you just did. So let's look at a simple example, the uh, vacuum cleaner example we saw earlier. We have a vacuum cleaner in a very simple room with six discrete squares where it can be. So it's a world with six states and it's in the bottom left state and in the top right state is some dust. And what we want the vacuum cleaner to do is to find the dust. That's all. So how we might model this as a reinforcement learning problem is um, with an environment and a learner. So we have uh, four actions. The uh, robot can move up, left, right, or down. The state is the location it's in after it's moved. So if it starts here where it's now, and it takes the action up, then its next state will be the square above that. If it moves up again, let's say it will stay in the square, so it bumps into a wall, basically. And then the reward, and this is important, we only reward it if it finds the dust. So we don't give it sort of intermediate rewards, or we don't tell it when it's near the, uh, near the dust or anything. All we, want to do, all we want it to do is find some dust. So once it's found the dust, it gets a reward. Otherwise, it's on its own. Everything else, it has to learn by exploring its world. So any movement results in a reward of zero, except if it's in a square, let's say, to the left of the dust, and it cho chooses to move right. Now, obviously, this is just a basic path planning problem. So there are much simpler ways of solving this, but this is sort of a... Uh, the simplest way of thinking about the simplest possible reinforcement learning problem we can think about. Uh, there's not really a lot to learn because we just have some dust. And the environment is stable, but it's sort of a simple starting point. So a more complicated point, or more, sorry, more complicated problem would be the problem of tic-tac-toe. Tic so it's a little bit like solving chess or solving uh, Go using reinforcement learning. Um, so how might we train an agent to learn tic-tac-toe using, uh, uh, using reinforcement learning? Basically what we do is we call the environment slash the game engine, uh, sorry, we call the opponent slash game engine, we call that the environment, everything else. Our current action is the move we take and the state is the state of the board after we've made that move. So if we've just put this circle here, then this whole thing becomes the next state. And again, the reward we instantiate in the simplest possible way. We really only give a reward for the things we know are, we absolutely know are good. So we say if we, if the state is final, if, the, if there's a, a line of three uh, symbols somewhere, and we've won, then we give a reward of one. If the state is uh, so that we've lost, we give a reward of minus one. Otherwise, zero. Otherwise, you're on your own. So how good this state is to be in, you have to figure out on your own. That's your learning problem. Another example is uh, control problems. So trying to control a robot or a, a, an automated 
uh, yeah, a robot or any uh, any kind of uh, thing like that. In this case, the card pole is a very uh, standard challenge in this field of, of control. Um, so what we have basically is a sort of robotic equivalent of the trick of putting a broom on your hand and balancing it. So we have a little robot, a uh, little robot car that can move to the left and to the right along a rail, and it has a, a pole balanced on a hinge, and the so the pole sort of is unstable; it falls over, and the cart has to move to the left or to the right to keep the pole upright. So we model this in reinforcement learning terms using a very simple physics engine or the real world. If we do this in a real world setting, then we just actually do this. Essentially, we implement this in a kind of uh, a robot cart, or we can do it in a physics engine like the animation shows. Um, we only have two real actions, which are to move left or to move right. And the state of the world can be fully described by the angle of the pole. And probably you need the, um, in most cases, you need the position of the cart as well. So you have two numbers, the angle of the pole and the, the position of the cart, which I ha haven't uh, shown here. Because usually you um, sort of uh, determine the problem to be over if the cart falls off the rail as well. So either the pole falls over or the cart falls off the, off the rail. Both are situations you want to prevent. Um, and again, we have this, what's called a sparse reward. So we really only give rewards for the sort of final state of the problem. So if the pole ends up vertical, then we've lost. If the cart ends up off the uh, rail, then we've lost, and then we get a reward of minus one. Otherwise, we get a re reward of zero, and there is no positive reward. The learning goal is just to maximize the reward by avoiding this minus one for as long as possible. So that's the way to think about this problem of reinforcement learning, how to instantiate it, how to apply it to real-world problems. Uh, here's a, a, a more impressive uh, demonstration. I won't turn on the sound for this one because it's just the noise of a helicopter. This is basically a, a remote control helicopter being trained to do lots of stunts. So this was a reinforcement learning problem, modeled as a reinforcement learning problem, uh, trained first in a simulator, then transferred to the real world and trained for real. Um, I think first trained to just stay upright to not crash, and then trained to mimic specific human movements that it was shown from a human controller. And I've never flown a micro, uh, um, a miniature helicopter myself, but I'm told these are very impressive stunts, especially the flying upside down, apparently very difficult. So it's a very, uh, um, uh, definitely a real-time problem, right? You have to have very immediate control. You have to really, uh, this, this iteration between world and agent happens very quickly here. It's probably uh, tens, maybe even hundreds of times per second. The state is evaluated and the next action is chosen. Um, this one probably didn't have this sparse reward, sparse loss, well, I should say sparse reward. Um, so in a sort of ideal setting, you would model this as saying, if the helicopters crash, then you get a reward of minus one, otherwise you get a reward of zero. That's probably not how they did this. I mean, that only works up to a certain point. So probably they, uh, well, certainly they started with imitation learning. So they started with supervised learning by just copying what, the hu what a human controller did. Uh, they used some reward shaping. So instead of giving this really sparse reward for intermediate states, they tried to guess what a good reward might be, to sort of steer the algorithm towards those intermediate states that are near the goal state. It's not ideal, but sometimes you have to do it. Ideally, you, you don't want to resort to reward shaping. And then it can also help, I'm not sure if they did this here, but uh, to add some auxiliary goals. So instead of just training the helicopter to do the trick right away, you uh, train it maybe to travel a certain distance or to uh, figure out what the uh, 
which actions cause the biggest change to its uh, visual inputs from its cameras. Uh, so if you want to do something as impressive as this, you usually need to resort to tweaking the um, tweaking the reinforcement learning problem a little bit. Um, but as demonstrations go, this is probably the point in history when everybody started paying attention to reinforcement learning suddenly. This is the thing DeepMind did before AlphaGo came along. And they are playing uh, Atari games. So they are looking at Atari's very old games console. And they are looking at the screen. So the algorithm learns, as we say, from pixels. All it sees is the screen. It doesn't get any auxiliary information. So all it gets as input is the screen. The, the state of the world is basically a, a pixel image. And all it gets as reward is the score. And the actions, of course, are a, a joystick with a, a fire button, which is not used in this game. Uh, but so you have a very limited number of actions you can take, but you have to, it, it is in real time, so you have to act quickly. And here it learns to play Breakout, which I'm sure you've all played, or, or seen at least, or well, if you haven't, it's pretty easy to figure out what the, the aim of the game is. And here's a very nice trick that the uh, system learned, is that if you build a tunnel, it's almost there, and you get the ball behind the wall of bricks, then you don't even have to do anything. So it actually figured out on its own to do that. And the same system, using the same training regimen, learned to play lots of Atari games. This wasn't just a way of, of learning how to play Breakout. Because they played from pixels, because they just had this screen and the Atari contro controller modeled, they, le they could learn to play about 26 different games using the same setup. And that's really the point where people started uh, paying attention. Um, and what they did, especially the, the, the nice thing, is that this mapping, this policy, the thing that your learner learns, the mapping from states to actions, which we call a policy, um, was a neural network, in fact, a deep neural network. So they uh, look at this screen, they add some convolutional layers, and they uh, output some uh, probability distribution over the actions. And they manage to, to train this neural network to learn these kinds of games. And that's really when people talk about reinforcement learning these days, they tend to talk about deep reinforcement learning. So using reinforcement learning in combination with a deep neural network. So that's the, basics, the basic framework of reinforcement learning. So now let's see how do we how do, we do this? How do we apply uh, this principle? How do we, or, or given uh, a problem that's been translated to a reinforcement learning problem, how do we solve it? Um, well, like I said, mostly we talk about using neural networks as policies. So let's try that. So here we have uh, our card poll problem, um, where the state is indicated by a position on the rail and an angle of the pole. And what we want to learn is a policy. We want to learn a function that maps a state to an action. In this state, we're going to take this action. And there are two actions. We can go left or we can go right. So what we do is we just build some neural network. And for this one, we don't need a very complicated neural network. We, put a, we uh, uh, create one output node for every action. We put a softmax over the output node, so this becomes a probability distribution over the actions. And then we have our policy function. And now all we have to do is figure out how to train this neural network, given this uh, reinforcement learning setup. And that brings us to the three main problems that we face, the three main things that make reinforcement learning difficult. Um, which are these three? Firstly, we have a non-differentiable loss. We can't just say we want to maximize this reward, so put a minus in front of it and backpropagate the uh, loss with any standard backpropagation uh, framework. 
because between the output of our neural network and the thing that gives us our reward are lots of non-differentiable things. Most importantly, the environment, which we don't have access to. Even if it were a differentiable function, like a simple physics simulator might be differentiable, so we might be able to backpropagate through it. The ultimate goal is to do this, build one of the build a real uh, card pole, and once we start learning for the real card pole, our environment is the actual environment, is the actual world, through to which we don't have access. We cannot backpropagate through the real world. So between the output of our net neural network and the thing that gives us our reward, there is a big bunch of uh, non-differentiable stuff happening. So we can backpropagate directly. Uh, secondly, there's a balance between exploration and exploitation. Uh, which I'll come back to. And that there's a problem of delayed reward, which I'll also come back to. I've slightly misorganized my slides here. Um, so this is the problem basically in a nutshell of exploration for versus exploitation. If we extend our uh, Earlier, uh, our earlier example of the uh, the dust gathering robot here. So he starts starts out in the corner of the room again, and he gets a reward if he finds the dust here. But we extend the room slightly with a long corridor, at the end of which is a big pile of dust, for which he gets a hundred times as much of a reward. Then, if we start learning a policy for this uh, for this uh, setting for this problem. The robot will very quickly figure out this path of going up, right, right, and finding the dust. If he then, once that policy has been learned, uh, if he then just exploits that policy, just follows that policy to um, maximize his reward, and let's say the world resets every time he finds some dust, then he just keeps on going back to the starting point and retracing the same path. Whereas if he has some bias for um, exploration as well, so if occasionally, even though he knows that this path will give him some dust, he might still take this path, even though he doesn't know that there's anything at the end of the corridor, if he's still compelled to explore his world a little bit, he will eventually find this big pile of dust and get a much higher reward. So this is sort of uh, something you see time and time again in these online scenarios, in these online learning settings, that you have to balance exploration of your world with exploitation of the knowledge you currently have. Because exploring will give you new knowledge, which eventually you will be able to exploit and turn into even bigger rewards, hopefully. But you have to make this balance. Then there's the delayed reward problem, which is that you get a reward back for your actions. You do an action, you get a reward. But the actual proper reward you get after a couple times depends on all the actions that came before it. So um, what you get from the environment is what's called an immediate reward. But what you're actually interested in is the sum of all your rewards over time. So for instance, in a game of chess, I only get a reward of one for the final move where I checkmate somebody. But that checkmate is dependent on lots and lots of good decisions I made during the course of the game. So that's the credit assignment problem. It's this final reward we get at the end. Which actions actually deserve to be rewarded? Which actions in our history actually deserve to be rewarded for that reward? Uh, a classic example here is, is the problem of... Uh, learning to drive a car, uh, as some of you uh, probably have done already or maybe even are currently doing. Uh, if you're learning to drive a car and you happen to crash, um, what a lot of people do, fortunately, is before, just before they crash, they brake, right? Now, if you were to learn by immediate reward, the action of braking is followed immediately by a crash. So you would learn that braking before you crash or braking when you see a wall in your... Uh, a uh, window is a bad thing, when actually it's a good thing. Uh, so you need to distribute this reward over everything that came before, and you need to somehow learn 
which actions led up to your, uh, your good or your bad results. That's called the uh, credit assignment problem, problem. And it's basically sort of the fundamental problem of uh, reinforcement learning. So we need algorithms that can help us do this. We have the model, we have this neural network, we know what we want the model to look like. All we have to do is figure out the weights that will make this policy maximize our reward. But we have to learn what the weight should be while we're interacting with the world. Uh, before we move on, a little notation just to specify exactly what we're talking about. So this reward function, if we're in state, a, uh, state S and we take action A, we get some reward. We call that function R of S and A. The state transitions, so which state, uh, if we're in state S and we take action A, we end up in another state. That's determined by a function. We call that function D. And then there's the policy, which is what we learn, what we choose to do. We'll call that pi. Pi of S is A, so in state S we take action A. Or sometimes it's nice to have a probabilistic policy, so in state S we get a probability distribution over all actions from which we can then sample or uh, choose the, one, the action with the highest probability. So these functions are, these functions together basically determine the environment, the reward function and state transition, and the policy is our model. Here's a little, those drawn in the diagram. Uh, there are a few extensions that we won't go into today or maybe we'll hint at briefly. Um, your state transitions can be probabilistic. For instance, if you have a, a robot with wheels and you tell the robot to, spi to spin its wheel by five millimeters, it might be on a slippery floor. So how much the wheel actually moves can be any tr anywhere between zero and five millimeters. Um, so then instead of uh, just getting a state transition function, you get a, a probabilistic state transition function. So given a state, you take an action, and then you get a probability distribution over where you actually end up. And there's also um, problems where the world is not fully observable. So for instance, if you're playing poker, then you don't know what, pe what cards other people have in their hands or what cards are on the table before they're turned over. So you need to deal with this kind of imperfect information. Uh, practically, it doesn't really matter that much because you sort of let the neural network deal with most of that. Um, so we won't go into that too much, into how to, uh, how to actually model that. So now we come to this problem of um, yeah, choosing the weights, learning the weights of the neural network while interacting with the world. Uh, and we have these three approaches. And we'll start with the simplest one, which is just random search. So we saw this already in the second lecture, I think, uh, that uh, basically before we, we went into all this gradient descent business, we had methods for learning <coughs> uh, black box optimization methods, basically, where all we needed was a reward function and a model space, and we could actually optimize our model. And that's basically what we have here, right? So if we want to optimize the card ball problem, we can just pick a random set of weights, see how well it does, see what our reward is, how long the uh, card stays up, and then uh, take a random step in model space, so perturb the model a little, see if the new model does better or worse. If it does better, we move to the new model. If it does worse, we stay with the old model and iterate that process. That's basic random search. This is an animation in that lecture. Uh, so you can apply that, and then you don't have, if you apply this to uh, this basic principle to reinforcement learning, you don't have any problems of differentiability or not being able to backpropagate because you can just learn the whole thing through random search, or if you want to make it a little bit more powerful through evolutionary methods, which is the most sort of more powerful population-based um, black box optimization method. Uh, here's an example of one of the Atari games for which that actually worked. Uh, this is called Frostbite. I 
couldn't quite figure out what the rules of the game are, but I think you have to jump on these moving platforms until the door forms in the top. And the fishes, I think you can eat. They're good for you, but you have to hit the platforms. That's as <laughs> much of it as I could figure out. But the point is, if you just use random search, this not even um, genetic algorithms or evolutionary methods, this is just random search, this already works, and you can already beat some of these diary games. Um, so that's sort of a pretty easy way to approach these things. And if you want to play around with this, I recommend starting with random search, because it's a good baseline. And there are more difficult methods, such as policy gradients and queue learning, but sometimes they're not worth it, right? If such a simple method already gets you there, then why not, um, why not try that first? Uh, nevertheless, sometimes you do want to get something more, uh, something closer to gradient descent and backpropagation. And the f probably the most popular way of doing that is uh, policy gradient descent. So here we get the same picture as I drew earlier for the um, credit assignment problem. So we have this trajectory, this sequence of states and rewards that we get. And only at the end, it's all zero, so only at the end do we get a positive reward or a negative reward. So now we see that something good, something's good. And the main, in its most simplest form, the main thing that policy gradient descent does is just to say, if I uh, end up at the end of my trajectory with a good reward, then I reward every single step before that. So these are all evaluations of my neural network, right? I've looked at the state and produced an action. So given that forward pass, I now need a backward pass. I need some error that I need to backpropagate. And if I get a good uh, total reward, or in this case, a good reward at the end, then I just give all of them, uh, I backpropagate on all of them with a, good re uh, with a positive reward. And if I get a bad reward at the end, uh, minus uh, negative reward, then I backpropagate on all of them with a uh, bad reward. So this sort of seems counterintuitive to what I said earlier that you uh, should actually distribute the reward. But the nice, the well, the, the intuition behind policy gradient descent is that if you do this for enough trajectories, and if your policy is varied enough, if you do enough exploration in your policy, then on average these things will average out to what you're actually looking for. So for instance, if you're at the, look back to the example of, of driving a car, if your policy is explorative enough, and hopefully you're doing this in a simulator so you don't have to actually crash your car, but then you will encounter uh, trajectories where you, you both break before you crash into a wall and you don't break before you crash into a wall. And if your reward function is good enough, then you see that actually if you don't break, you get a worse reward on average over all these trajectories. So it's a kind of stupid way of, of assigning, your, um, assigning your rewards to a neural network, but because you do them over, some, over a large sample of trajectories, you end up uh, averaging out and you end up getting a good, uh, a good gradient. So to go a little deeper, essentially what you're doing is you're doing the same thing as we did with the uh, recurrent neural networks. You are unrolling your network over time. So you have a network that maps from state to action. You sample a reward. Uh, sorry, you sample an action, you get a reward, end up in a new state, and so on and so on. So this is your trajectory, which has some differentiable bits, but most of it is not differentiable. So we can backpropagate this reward down the whole unrolled pipeline. But then we just end up with some reward which we assign to all the different instances of the policy network. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it actually applies not just to reinforcement learning, but to any case where you have a, um, a deep learning pipeline where part of it is not differentiable. So if you have here <coughs> a neural network that does some forward pass, and somewhere in this forward pass happens some sampling, 
or some other function that you can't backpropagate over. Maybe you don't have access to the thing that computes this, like in reinforcement learning, or you're just sampling something in a way that you can, cannot uh, get rid of. What you can do is, after you sample, you sample multiple trajectories. You get your supervised signal, and you average the supervision uh, here. So the blue lines you just backpropagate as normal. But once you get to this node where you don't get a gradient anymore, you just take the average of all your outputs, roughly, and we'll look at the specifics later. And then you get a kind of average gradient here that you can then backpropagate over this part of your network. So it doesn't just work for reinforcement learning, it works for general settings where you have a, a, a pipeline, a differentiable pipeline with one bit that isn't differentiable. So that's very useful. Um, and the mathematics of how to actually work out what you're actually doing here are pretty simple. So we'll work through those in a couple of steps. Uh, so let's say our reward, R of A here. Uh, so A is the action we're uh, tasked with taking at the moment. We want to take the action A. Um, and our reward is not the immediate reward, but our eventual reward. So R here, R of A, stands for our eventual reward. So what we want to optimize, what we want the gradient over, is the expectation over the um, uh, probability, because our network gives us a, a probability over actions, right? And under that probability that our policy gives us, we want to maximize the, expe the expected ultimate reward. And we want, because we want to optimize that, we want the gradient over that. So we, want, we have a gradient over an expectation. So that's something we have to deal with. So we write out the expectation, which is the sum of PA times RA. And PA here is the output of our policy, right? So PA gives us, in our current state, the uh, probability distribution over the, over the actions. And then this sum represents the expectation that we want to maximize. Um, well, the gradient we know we can move inside the sum. We've done that a lot of times before. So now we have the gradient, the sum over these uh, gradients of these terms. Uh, just as a little trick, we multiply and divide by PA. So this, there's no real intuition here. We just do this so that we can move to the next step. But we can do this. It's the same thing, right? We multiply by PA, divide by PA, so it stays the same, uh, same value. And then we use this property of the um, logarithm, that the gradient of the logarithm of Z is 1 over Z times the gradient of Z, so this is the chain rule and the gradient, of the, log uh, the gradient of the logarithm, which gives us this, uh, except that we move in the opposite direction. Normally, when we take the gradient of the logarithm, we move from here to here. But now we realize that this looks like this, so we just fill it in, and we end up with this, which is, if we move it back to an expectation, the expectation of the reward, the expectation over A, of the reward times the gradient of the logarithm of the probability of A. So this tells us exactly how we need to implement this um, policy gradient algorithm. Namely, we uh, if we want to estimate this gradient, we can do, we can do that by estimating this. It's the same as estimating this gradient. And to estimate this gradient, we can sample a bunch of traje trajectories. So we sample a bunch of ac actions, and we follow each of these actions through to the rest of the pipeline. And for each of our each trajectory in our sample, we multiply the ultimate reward by the gradient of the logarithm of the probability of that action. And that gives us an estimation of the gradient, which we can then use for further backpropagation. That's the policy gradient algorithm. 
Uh, and that algorithm was used on alpha go. And I think alpha zero as well. Um, and it's probably the most popular basic algorithm. There's a lot of extensions and a lot of improvements, uh, which we won't go into today. Uh, but the um, Atari example you saw earlier, the breakout one, that actually used Q learning, a variant called deep Q learning, um, which is probably supplanted in popularity by um, by policy gradients these days, but it's still worth diving into because so far random search and policy gradients, they haven't really told us very much about reinforcement learning, about the details of reinforcement learning. And Q-learning, um, despite being a very nice algorithm, it also gives us some insight into what we're actually doing when we're executing the algorithm, what we're actually learning about our, our model and how we're learning about the world. So that's our last algorithm that we'll investigate. And in order to really show you the details, we have to uh, first apply it to a very, very simple world. So we take our vacuum cleaner world and we make it even simpler. So now there are just two, um, two parts to the room, two states, state A and state B. And the vacuum cleaner can only move left and right. And all it has to do is move right once and then it's found the dust. Uh, so that's sort of the absolutely simplest form of a reinforcement learning algorithm, a reinforcement learning problem. And now to uh, explain Q learning, we need to look a little bit at what we're actually optimizing. What are we actually looking to uh, to do here to optimize which which value? And that's usually taken to be the discounted reward. So at the moment we are in some state, state zero. We take action zero, we get a reward. And after that we end up in another state and we take another action. So we follow this trajectory based on our policy. And what we do is basically we sum up just all the uh, immediate rewards that we get, and that's our total reward, except we discount them a little bit. So we take some, sm some value very close to one gamma, and the first, for the first step we just count the immediate reward. For the second step we count the immediate reward times gamma, and for the third step we take the immediate reward times gamma squared, and so on and so on. And this ensures that, essentially, if we can get the same reward now instead of the same reward in three steps, we prefer to get it now. That's really what this says. Oops. So that's the discounted reward, and that's basically the quantity that we're trying to maximize. And we have the policy, which we already saw, which is given a particular state, what action do we take? And then we basically, given a policy, we can work out what our discounted reward is, right? Because given a policy, we know what we're going to do. So we know what all the future states are. So for, for a particular policy, we can work out the value of a state. Because from that state, if we know the policy, we know what the discounted reward is going to be. So then we know the value of that state. How valuable is it for us to be in that state? Well, that's the discounted reward we're going to have from that state. And you can rewrite this discounted reward. We did this again, we did this also in the um, ensembling lecture as a recursive function. So if you rewrite it like this, so you take the immediate reward times the gamma plus gamma times the value of the next state. If you unpack this, so if you fill in uh, this definition here again, then you see that step by step by step you um, expand into this definition of the discounted reward. Um, there's a slide in the ensemble lecture that, that shows this literally. Um, so now that we have the policy and we have the value function, we can ask what is the optimal policy? Which policy will maximize our discounted reward? Which we define like this, call it pi star which is the policy such that for all states, oh, there's a little bit of typesetting gone wrong here, but for all states, uh, over all, uh, over all policies, oh yeah, sorry, um, 
it's a policy that over all states makes the choice that the policy that is optimal for that state would have made. So it's a kind of ensemble policy that looks at the space of all policies. And for a particular state, some policy leads to the ma uh, maximal value. So we can just define the policy that follows that policy at that particular moment as the optimal policy. That's basically what this says. And then the optimal value function is just the policy that, um, sorry, is just the value function of that policy. And these are usually completely incomputable, inscrutable numbers that we'll never find. But we just, it's, for now, it's good to know there is an optimal policy. And we can do a bit of rewriting, and that will lead to the uh, uh, Q-learning algorithm. So the optimal policy is just, uh, oh yeah, now we can rephrase the optimal policy. I don't know if it will make it more clear or less, or more confusing, but, um, because basically here in the last slide, we define the optimal value function. So it's the value of a state under the optimal policy. So then we can redefine the optimal policy as basically choosing the action that has maximal discounted rule, that has maximal, that leads, sorry. Choosing the action that leads to the state with maximal value under the optimal value function. So we're sort of getting into the territory of uh, recursive, function, uh, recursive definitions here. And then we just fill this in. So this is the discounted reward under the, ma uh, under the optimal value function. So we're just choosing the action that maximizes this. And now we can define this. Uh, we uh, take this bit here and we call that Q. Just define a function Q, Q star in this case, because we're talking in terms of optimal policies. And this um, allows us, this Q allows us to rewrite the optimal, both the optimal policy and the optimal value function in terms of Q. So now the optimal uh, policy is just the policy that chooses the action that maximizes Q. And the optimal uh, value is the value is the Q value of the action that uh, maximizes Q. And the reason we did this, the reason we introduced this Q function is because this here comes the big magic trick of the Q learning algorithm, which may take a little while to wrap your head around, is that we can redefine Q in terms of itself. Because we've redefined this um, optimal value function in terms of Q, so we can fill it into the definition of Q. So now Q is defined as the immediate reward times this discounted uh, value of Q. So we uh, get Q over the next state. So we uh, have a state with an action we take in that state. We take the immediate reward, discounting factor, and then the uh, value resulting from the action that results in the highest Q function, given that we took action A in state S. And the benefit of this um, circular, this recursive definition of Q, because remember this still defines the optimal policy and the optimal value function, is that we can now ask for a given Q, if we have some Q function, we just make, make one up, is it optimal? We can ask, is that the optimal Q function? So we make, some, make up some Q function for our uh, vacuum cleaner problem. Sorry, some unintended animation happening here. We make up some Q function for our uh, vacuum cleaner problem. We can now ask, did we, did we get lucky? Does this happen to be the optimal Q function? Well, the, only, the way to figure that out is just to fill in these values and see if it is. Um, I forgot whether I, I did do this on pen and paper, but I didn't fill it in here. Well, since we're a little behind time, I will uh, let you know that it isn't. 
if you want to understand this, it's a good thing to uh, thing to try at home with pen and paper. Just fill in these values here. It helps you understand what all the parts of the uh, Q function mean. And that way you can ask, well, what is my uh, uh, Q function optimal? Which in theory allows you to just randomly select Q functions until you found the one that's optimal. Of course, that's not very efficient. So now the question is, how can we use this recurrence relation to find the optimal Q function or to search for something that's close to the optimal Q function? And for that, we can use uh, what's called the um, method of solving recurrent equations by iteration. So let's make things a little bit simpler. Uh, in this, in our previous slide, we had a recurrence relation over functions, big tables of numbers. Let's make it a bit simpler and just uh, do it with a scalar function now. So we have a simple function here, x. And obviously, if I ask you to solve this for x, you would start rewriting and you start moving things left and right. But actually, to illustrate here, you can do something else as well. You can see this as a recurrence relation and use iteration. So you just start with a random value of x, let's say 0, and you apply this as a kind of computer program. So you just say, I fill in uh, 0 here, and I compute the outcome. So I move from 0 to 0 squared minus 2, and I end up at minus 2. And then I do the same thing again. I fill in minus 2, so I get minus 2 squared. Minus 2 is 2. I do the same thing again. I fill it in. And then I get a stable state. Once I fill in 2, I end up with 2, which means that for x is 2, this recurrence relation holds true. So I just iterate until I find something where the left side equals the right side, and then I found my fixed point, I found my stable state, I found my um, solution. And we can do this same thing with our Q function. So we just, this and this is the Q learning algorithm. We just start with some randomly or some, we initialize Q to zero. So for now we just treat Q as a big table of values. Instead of a neural network, we just enumerate all the values of Q. We, um, do some interacting with the environment. So we're in a state S and we take some action A. We arrive in a successor state. We receive a reward. And then we just apply this recurrence relation. But instead of checking if it's true, we update the uh, Q function. So we provide in this big table a new value based on this uh, part of the recurrence relation that we want to, want to be true. And in that way, we move Q closer to its uh, intended value, closer to this fixed point where the this optimum where the recurrence relation actually is true. And it's instructive to look at what actually happens when we apply this. Uh, so here's our six uh, six chamber world again. Uh, so let's say that we just explore. So we didn't actually oh, sorry. We didn't actually say how to take action A, how to choose the action to take. For now, we'll just say that's given. There's a way to do that. And let's say the robot goes up, right, and right, is then reset, and then tries the same path again, up, right, right. So somebody tells it to take that path, and we'll see how, what happens to its updates of the Q function. So here we have a big Q function with all the states it can be in. We've only enumerated the actions up and right for now, just to uh, keep things simple. So not much happens at first. It goes up. It doesn't get an immediate reward. And this value stays zero as well, because all the values are zero. It goes right. Same thing happens. It goes, goes right. And then once it moves from C to E, it actually gets an immediate reward. So we uh, this value is still zero, because at that point the whole table is still zero but we fill in the immediate reward. So we update SA, this part of the table, uh, so in C moving right, 201. And then we found the dust, so we reset. We follow the same trajectory again. Uh, so we reset the robot to the beginning position, but we don't reset the queue. We keep learning. Uh, we move up 
from A to B we move up, um, so we don't get an immediate reward, and we take the max over these values, so we take the max over B and its corresponding actions, which are all zero still at this point, so we stay at zero. But then when we're in B, that's where something new happens. We move right. So uh, let me get this right. We're in B and we move right. We don't get any immediate reward. But we look at the successor state, C. We take the max over all its actions, which now contains a 1. So now this value is 1. Because if from C we move right, we know that we can get a reward of 1 eventually. We multiply that by the discount and we get 0 0.9. And we add that to the table. And we move on to E. So what happens here is that the um, immediate reward that we observe in our first pass, in our second pass it moves sort of back one state. And every time we redo the same trajectory, the uh, immediate reward that we've observed is moved back one state in our state space. And it sort of propagates back to the starting states the more and more we explore. And that's basically how this Q-learning algorithm works. And then all we have to do, oh, sorry, one more point. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, did, I didn't say how to, how to actually explore the state space, so which actions actually to take. Um, Practically, what you do is you follow your best policy that you've learned so far, but with some small probability epsilon, you take a random state. That's called greedy epsilon exploration, epsilon greedy exploration, and it's sort of a reasonable way of doing this. And epsilon here is a hyperparameter that you have to set, or you can actually decay while you're learning. And then, last slide before the break. Um, so now, for now, uh, all we've done is, is learn a big table of numbers, big a uh, table of numbers to represent Q. Uh, all we have to do to do deep Q learning, to learn with a neural network, is we have to implement Q with a neural network, which is easily done if you just take the neural network that we've already made that maps a state to all of the actions. Um, then instead of learning a prob probability distribution over the actions, you just learn, uh, you just do basic regression to learn the Q value of the functions. And then as you're exploring, you can basically implement this update rule through backpropagation. So you say you do a forward pass of the network, you execute your, you ask the environment to execute your, the action you've chosen, and then you observe uh, an immediate reward and your next uh, uh, an immediate reward and your successor state. And then you compare it to this value from your current Q, Q function, and you backpropagate the difference to update your, uh, your network. So uh, I've run very late. Apologies for that. Let's take a 15-minute break, and then I'll see if I can squeeze these three things into 30 minutes. All right, find your seat. Let's get started again. Um, I had a little uh, video planned for you. This is the trailer for a documentary called uh, Alpha Go, which is a very nice documentary that uh, sort of gives a nice sense of how dramatic this victory was when uh, DeepMind Alpha Go beat this Go player called Lisa Dole. I highly recommend this documentary. But in the interest of time, we'll skip it, and we'll skip the trailer as well. The, there's a link in the slides. Sorry. <laughs> so this is uh, the guy. This is Lisa Dahl, who, who won these, uh, who uh, lost, I think, four out of five matches, or th uh, two of, uh, three out of five matches against uh, AlphaGo. So I'll try to give you, um, in the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, an impression of, of how AlphaGo roughly works. I won't be able to explain all the details, but let's see how far we get. Um, so to start with the game of Go, I won't assume that you all are 
professional Go player, so let's look at the basics of, of how Go works. Um, it's actually a lot simpler than chess in many ways. Basically, we have this uh, board which has a grid on it, and players alternate placing white and black stones. There's a white player and a black player. And they place stones on the um, points where the grid lines intersect, one by one. And basically what you want to do is this. You want to encircle the stones of the other player. So if I'm black and I encircle the white stones like this, I get to take the white stones off the board and they count to my point total. And once the whole board is filled, uh, all the points uh, are counted up, all the encircled places are counted up, and that's your final score. So if you've encircled more stones of the other player, you've won. And you get this kind of arms race where you are trying to encircle the other player, but then suddenly they're encircling you. And it gets very complicated. Um, so there are a lot of claims about AlphaGo in the media, or there were a lot of claims when AlphaGo came out. Um, uh, some of them were a, wit were a bit overblown, so I wanted to... So I usually put these uh, in the lecture just to go through them. Um, so first, and then some of these claims come from DeepMind themselves, so it also shows that you know, they're a, they are a company and they do do marketing as well as science. Um, so AlphaGo is an important move towards general purpose AI. I mean, fair enough in the sense that any of these advancements are, are helpful. Um, but there is no sense in which Alpha, what AlphaGo does is general purpose AI. It's very much a purpose-built machine uh, um, for the purpose of playing Go. It maps a Go state to a Go action, and it really cannot do anything else. Uh, things and learns in a human way, that's really only true in the sense that neural networks mimic brains. And if you remember the neural network lecture, that really isn't that true because neural networks, they're not that neural and they're not that networky. They're really just a composition of differentiable linear algebra, um, which eliminates the third point as well. Um, oh yeah, this is an interesting one. So they say, they always say, Go has more possible positions than there are atoms in the universe, and that's why it's difficult, which is sort of fair, because if you look at the board, you get 19 times 19 is 371 or something, possible places to put your stone. So if you look at the tree of possible moves, one following the other, uh, that tree has a branching factor of 371. So that's a big tree with a lot of moves in it. Um, but this is also true for chess. Chess also has more possible positions than atoms in the universe. Fewer than Go. Um, so really, it's more true to say that what makes Go difficult, firstly, is that it has a high branching factor. Not that this tree is necessarily big, because all these trees are huge, but the tree branches a lot. And secondly, what is, is mentioned less often is that um, you have to look very deep into the tree to figure out whether a certain move or whether a certain, uh, style, uh, uh, a certain play makes sense, because once you start trying to encircle your other player and he starts trying to encircle you, you have to sort of keep doing that for, you can keep doing that for a long time before you figure out, I'm gonna hit the edge of the board first, so I'm gonna lose the battle. So before you see which of you is going to win this particular line of play, you have to look lots and lots of steps into this tree, and this tree has a very high branching factor. And that's why it's such a difficult problem. Um, so it's not even just a high branching factor, it's a high branching factor plus the fact that it takes a lot of moves to reason through uh, what makes a good play and who's going to win a certain, uh, certain battle. Uh, so that's what makes Go difficult. So let's look at some, some uh, older approaches to the game of Go, sort of from before reinforcement learning was successfully applied and before machine learning was successfully applied. Uh, so with all these games, these two-player games with full information, they start with the minimax algorithm. I won't go into the exact minimax algorithm. Basically, we talk about this game tree of, of I do this and then he does that and then I do this. We sort of enumerate all possible futures from the current state. Um, 
you can look at that game tree, look at all the leaves, which are the states where somebody's won. And you can label these leaves with your reward. So one if I've won, minus one if he's won, zero if it's draw. And then Minimax is just an algorithm that tells you how to work this reward up to the current state so that you can choose your best action. So it's basically an algorithm for searching the whole tree exhaustively. Uh, practically, it doesn't really matter because for me, for Go, Minimax is absolutely useless because this tree branches out 19-fold uh, every move. So really just looking too, uh, too deep into the tree is almost impossible, and you have to look lots of steps into this tree to get any value out of it. So what, um, there's a lot more value to, um, instead of searching this tree exhaustively with an algorithm like Minimax, there's a lot more value to searching the tree randomly, something called rollouts, where instead of looking at all the moves I could possibly, be, possibly make and then looking at all the moves my opponent could possibly respond uh, with, I just pick a random one. So I pick a random move, and I pick a random move by my opponent, and a random move, and so on and so on. Uh, and then I do that a couple of times, and then I just tally up the estimate of who's going to win. So if I've won 15 times, and he's won 15 times, then my estimate for this move is that the value of this state, in reinforcement learning terms, is, uh, is zero, because I'm as likely to win as, he's as, as he is to win. And you can do rollouts with just random moves, or you can come up with a simple policy that picks reasonable moves, and then do rollouts with a simple policy. Uh, and that's sort of a, a very early result in terms of a very simple method that actually worked pretty well for Go. Um, and that was uh, extended to something called Monte Carlo Tree Search, where we sort of do the best of both worlds. So we do these rollouts to explore the tree very quickly, but we also keep a little memory of the local tree to build up uh, sort of promising regions of the tree without exploring the whole tree. So it's always a little difficult to explain because it's you have to sort of start from a, a tree that's partially explored. So let's imagine we're sort of joining the algorithm halfway. It's already partially explored some of the tree. And labeled, uh, every node is labeled with our current estimate for the probability that we will win starting at that node. Uh, and what we do to expand the tree is first we do a random walk from the root following the probabilities. So nodes that are more probable to result in a win for us, we follow more likely. But all nodes have some probability. We follow the probabilities down to the edge, to a leaf. And then we f expand the leaf uh, into a random move. So we do a random move from that leaf. That's called expansion. And then from that expanded node, we do a rollout. So we roll out all the way to the end. And then we label the node with how many of those rollouts, we just did one rollout, how many of those rollouts resulted in a win, in this case, zero out of one. And we, um, in a rather unfortunate clash of naming, we backpropagate. It's more commonly called backup these days because it's, it has nothing to do with neural network backpropagation. So let's call this a backup instead. We back up this value. So now all the um, nodes above this leaf are updated with this new information because we've, done, we've seen one extra gain, which we lost. So all the nodes get one higher in the uh, denominator. And in this case, because we lost not one higher in the numerator. We update all these probabilities of all the nodes that we followed to this leaf. And in that way, we sort of expand our tree for, for the time that we, that we have available to make our choice. And then once, we, once the time is up, we just pick the move that leads to the highest probability of winning. That's basic Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. So you'll notice that it doesn't really do any machine learning. 
all it does is search the game tree, tries to sort of approximate this uh, minimax algorithm, and it doesn't use any neural networks. Um, and this worked pretty well. I think this could uh, sort of before AlphaGo came along, this kind of algorithm could beat a, a seasoned amateur. So then AlphaGo came along, and basically what they did is they took this idea and they put some neural networks into it. So let's see how that works. Um, firstly, they trained two networks, a policy network and a value network. So we know what this means, right? A policy is something that maps a state to an action, so maps a particular state of the board to where we should put our stone. And a value maps a state of the board to the value of that state, how likely are we to win from that state. And then they combined this with Monte Carlo tree search in the following way. So they start with imitation learning, which is just learning what a human does. So they had a big database of human Go games, and they trained the policy and the value network from those human Go games. So you train the policy network just to copy what the humans did, and the value you just uh, label the states with the eventual outcome. And that's sort of a uh, starting point for training the networks. And then you improve by playing against a pool of previous iterations and against yourself. And then you update in this self-play, you update by a policy gradient. So here is where the reinforcement learning comes in. So you do a lot of self-play, and then you update the gradients that way, using policy gradient. Um, and then during actual play, when you start playing against your, uh, your world champion Go player, you take this value network and you take this policy network and you insert them into a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. And here's how they drew it in the, uh, in the paper. So it's the same, basically the same picture as we saw earlier. So you um, build your basic Monte Carlo tree search um, subtree. Once it comes to doing a rollout, oh yeah, and the, the values here I think are a mixture of what the value network says and what your statistics are from the Monte Carlo tree search. Then when it comes to doing a rollout, you do a rollout using your policy network. They actually had two policy networks, uh, so a slow policy network for the first couple of steps and then a fast policy network for the final couple of steps to the end of the game. Um, or I don't know if they rolled out all the way to the end or rolled out to before the end and then estimated the value using the value network. That's also possible. And then you do backup as before. You aggregate your statistics using what you've seen. So it's a slightly ad hoc combination of um, methods where you use reinforcement learning during training, but you don't actually use reinforcement learning directly during execution, during inference. Uh, so it's sort of a grab bag approach of everything that worked. Uh, but it did work, so uh, why not? But then uh, a year or two later, they came out with Alpha Zero, Alpha Go Zero, which is sort of a cleaned up version, which works faster, um, as a system is a little bit more sort of uh, disciplined, and most importantly, it doesn't use any human information. So basically, this is a, a Go system that hasn't been told anything except the basics of Go, the basic rules of Go, maybe not even that. Um, and all it does is um, play against itself. And from that, it builds up an understanding of Go that is good enough not only to beat this existing alpha Go, which we've now discussed. So ultimately, it learns to work better than the previous alpha Go, and hence better than Lisa Doll. Uh, and then goes much, much more beyond that as well. And they, uh, in the paper, they structure their paper as, as basically applying three main tricks to the existing AlphaGo uh, methodology. 
So they combine the policy and the value nets into a single network. They view MCTS as a policy improvement operator, and they add something called residual connections with batch normalization. So we'll go through these step by step. The first one is pretty simple. Instead of training two separate networks from for the policy and the values, uh, it's turned upside down here. So this is where the input ha happens at the top, moving down to the output. Um, instead of learning two separate networks, we learn what they call a two-headed monster. So there's a couple of feature extractors on the board, and then it splits into two, uh, two heads. One is the policy output, and one is the value output, which means that these bottom layers that are shared by both networks get gradients from both problems. So they can learn more generic uh, features and get more information for how to learn those features. So that's very, uh, that can be very helpful. Uh, then in this case, they actually use the MCTS principle during training by viewing it as basically what they call a policy improvement operator. So basically the idea here is what they say, if you have a policy, any policy, and you use it in MCTS, so you use it to search the tree, you get a new policy, because MCTS is also something that teaches you to play Go, which is sort of guaranteed to be better than the old policy, right? If you use the old policy and you search with depth zero, you just get the old policy, and the more you search, the better your new policy. So it's a kind of applying MCTS as a, pro a policy improvement operator. So what they do is they start with some initial policy, they make it play against itself, in, uh, or rather, they search the game tree assuming that it's playing against itself using MCTS. And then they observe the resulting policy resulting from that as MTC MCTS, and they use that as a training objective. So it's sort of learning this, this improvement step that MCTS gives you is then given as a training objective to the network so that the network internalizes that improvement. So that's kind of an abstract way of thinking about it, but, um, well, that's all the, <laughs> uh, all the explanation I have time for. Um, so that's what they do. They call it a policy improvement operator, and during training they apply this MCTS uh, improvement. And then the final trick uh, doesn't have anything to do with reinforcement learning or Go. It's just a very good neural network trick that was discovered between AlphaGo and AlphaZero, um, which is a combination of residual connections and batch normalization. So this is something you can do to any neural network you're uh, working on. Basically, if you have a bunch of layers where the size of the input here is the same as the size of the out output here, so the layers, you can have as many layers as you like, but they have to keep the size of the, uh, your tensor the same, then you add what's called a skip connection or a residual connection where basically the input here moves directly to the output and bypasses the layers. So you just copy over this input without applying the layers and you mix them together here. So the result here is the output of the layers plus the original input times some learnable hyperparameter A. And what that gives you is a situation where you can sort of, during the start of learning, you can start with a very deep neural network, but during the start of learning, you can sort of disable most of the layers by setting A very large, so that most of the forward pass of the neural network bypasses the layers. If you do this for lots of blocks, you constantly use this residual layer, and you're sort of bypassing everything the layer do, layers do, and you have a very simple neural network that you can start training, until things get complicated, and then you can slowly reduce A and increase the, the reliance on the layers. So instead of immediately having to train this very deep neural network that does lots and lots of steps, you sort of gradually ease up towards learning a deeper and deeper neural network, uh, which works very well, especially if you do it in combination with something called batch normalization, which again is not uh, specific to Neuro, uh, not specific to reinforcement learning. Uh, 
basically, if you cast your mind back to the um, deep learning lecture, uh, the first deep learning lecture, we talked a little bit about how important weight initialization is, because it's very important to keep your activations from blowing up. So you don't want your activations to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you don't want your gradients to shrink and shrink and shrink, or your gradients to blow up. So it's important that you initialize your weight such that if the input is centered at zero and has variance one in all directions, so your input is uh, standardized, that your output is also standardized. That's how you want to initialize your layers, right? And then if you follow these two principles that uh, more or less happened. Um, and then we also saw for our very first input, for our data, that standardization is a good idea. So if we compute the mean of our data and the standard deviation and we uh, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, then our data will take this shape of, of being zero normalized and having variance one in every direction of being standardized. So uh, batch normalization sort of solves this problem of initialization, of, of having nicely centered data with uh, variance one by putting this standardization approach into the network. So here we have our residual connection, some part of our network, and then we apply a batch norm layer, which just looks at what comes in, reshapes it, and gives it back. And uh, batch norm is a slightly unusual layer because it's the one of the few layers that actually looks at the batch information. So all other layers are just apply it individually, as it were, to every instance in your batch. But batch norm actually does an operation over the batch dimension. And what it does is just this standardization. So it looks at all the instances in your batch. Let's say there are m instances. Uh, it computes the mean. It computes the standard deviation. It standardizes them, called that xy. And then it applies a learnable multiplier and uh, uh, additive uh, value. So it, it applies a gamma and a beta, which are learnable parameters. So basically, it takes your data, it standardizes it, and then if you do need your uh, output to be non-standard, it allows you to shift it in a certain direction and blow it up or shrink it a little bit. So you might ask them, what's the point if you're still getting non-standard data out of it? Because you're the operation of creating non-standard data is based on learnable parameters. So you're getting a gradient over this gamma and a gradient over this beta. But after that, if you backpropagate um, uh, the input to your next layer is going to be standardized data. Uh, so the, the, the gradients over your data will be much better behaved. So this, is, uh, this batch normalization can really help to speed up training and to train much deeper networks. Uh, so that's what they, uh, what they did. That's what allowed them to train much quicker with AlphaGo, uh, with AlphaZero, and train uh, much deeper uh, policy and uh, value networks. Uh, so here we see AlphaGo's training, AlphaZero's training uh, regime. So this is a, a version with 40 blocks. So a single block of this uh, bunch of convolutions with a skip layer and batch normalization. Uh, they have 40 of those on top of each other. They train for several days. And after one or two days, I think 120 hours from memory, it beat AlphaGo Lee, so it beat the point where it uh, beat Lee Sedol. And then a little later, it beat AlphaGo Master, a sort of later ver version of the AlphaGo engine. And then it sort of kept going slowly, slowly, and sort of diminishing returns. Um, and of course, because there was no notion, really, of the rules of Go, or uh, of, of, of training it specifically to learn anything about Go, it was very easy to apply this to chess and similar games as well, and Shogi. Shogi is a kind of um, Japanese form of chess, I think. Um, 
So here you see where after 200 hours it learns to beat stockfish, which is well was up till then the best um, the best chess engine, which used just research, no uh, no machine learning of any kind. So this is suddenly the first time that chess was actually solved using machine learning. Uh, and same similar sort of results for Go and Kyogi. So at that point we figured, well, uh, Go is pretty much solved now. Uh, so what's the next frontier? Uh, let's say Go is solved. So the next frontier, then the question was, what's the next frontier? What's the next difficult thing? And uh, DeepMind and, and many other uh, people decided to move their attention to StarCraft, which if you've never played it, is a real-time strategy game where you basically build buildings. Buildings give you units. Units can help you harvest resources so you can pay for more buildings and units. Or units can help you fight the units of the enemy. Um, I hope that's succinct enough of a, an explanation. Uh, but the most important thing is that it's real-time. So you're just building and clicking and doing stuff, and your opponent is also building and clicking and doing stuff. At the same time, you're not waiting for each other to make a turn. Um, so here is the, the recently released Alpha Star, which is a, a big leap forward by DeepMind again. Uh, so what we see here... Well, the first thing that I have to say about Alpha Star is that we're at a sort of uncomfortable moment in that we've seen this demonstration. Uh, so this is uh, Alpha Star. They're a system playing against two world-level StarCraft players called TLO and Mana. Uh, I forgot which game. Uh, this is a Mana game, so we see Alpha Star's view here and Mana here. Um, so this is a pretty pretty high level game, um, but they haven't published the paper yet. So they've shown a demonstration and they've said we're going to publish the details in the paper, but that hasn't happened yet. I was hoping it would before this lecture, but it didn't. Um, so I can't really give you the details of how Alpha Star works. I can just sort of work on the hints that DeepMind have given us. Uh, and this is one visualization. So here we see on the left what. Alpha go uh, Alpha Star sees sees the whole field. Then some weird visualization of the uh, network uh, activations, and then that maps to uh, actions over all the units it's currently controlling. So you're building lots, of building an army of units, and all of these units are individually controlled. So you have a huge action space. Um, yeah. So these are basically the big problems of StarCraft, why it was chosen as sort of the next really difficult problem. It's real time, so there's no game tree or anything to search in any meaningful way. You just have to immediately map your uh, what you see to an action. Uh, it's imperfect information, so most of this, basically any part of the game, uh, the map that is not observed by one of your units is hidden from view. So you have to send units out to scout to see what's happening at the risk of losing those units. So you're paying, you're trading off units against information. You have this huge diverse, ac diverse action space that grows and shrinks as you make more units or as you lose more units. And uh, it, it's one of these um, games where there's no single best strategy. So you have, uh, it's a little bit like rock, paper, scissors, where if somebody else picks a certain strategy and you pick a certain strategy, um, there's no strategy that conquers all other strategies. You have this sort of cycle in your space of strategies. Uh, so the ideal thing to do is, is pick a reasonable strategy that conquers lots of other strategies and then try and adapt once you figure out what your opponent's strategy is. Uh, currently, this is all we have to go on to figure out how Alpha Star works. Uh, so I've picked out a few of these ones, the ones that I can more or less explain. Um, we have a transformer torso for the units, deep LSTM core with autoregressive policy at a pointer network and multi-agent learning. So I'll run through them very quickly. Um, 
yeah, I'd, I'm sort of guessing here, so it's, it's not super uh, relevant, but I'm sort of guessing this is what they mean. Uh, needless to say, none of this will be on the exam. This is just sort of well, informative. This is the current state of the art. This is the current open problem. Um, so they start with this transformer head, which is a kind of uh, a bias towards learning about objects and the relations between those objects, because that's very important, right? You have these units, and you need to somehow start learning relations between those units, like this is a, a harvester and I want to send it to that particular resource to start harvesting. So these two, u this unit and that resource, they have this relation. So that's how the neural network should start thinking about these things. And uh, what they've used there is something called a transformer, which um, I don't really have time to fully explain. It. Maybe next uh, lecture I might actually go into these a little bit more. But it's a lot like this idea of embeddings that we saw in the last lecture, where you take these embeddings for all of your units and you multiply them out, which gives you a kind of recommendation for how important every unit is for every other unit. If you do this for multiple layers of embeddings, you get sort of multiple levels of recommendation. So you can get a vector of, um, of ways in which two units can be related. And what you do then is you multiply that again by the embedding vector to sum over, uh, to, uh, to sum over the uh, existing embeddings to get a kind of new, uh, a new embedding that is a mixture of the original embeddings according to this, uh, this generated self-attention. So that's very abstract, but you can just think of this as a way of um, reasoning about the relations between particular units because it's functioning roughly like a recommender system in that it's multiplying out these, uh, taking the dot product of these embeddings and uh, using the result as a, as a kind of a value of, of how important they are for each other. Uh, I'll skip pointer networks for now. I think we're running up to the end. So LSTMs we've seen, right? Uh, what they do is uh, sequential sampling for the policy head because they have this huge space of actions um, that are going to depend on each other. So if you try and produce this big bag of actions in one go, you tend to get a sort of mixture where the relations between the actions aren't very strong. So what you, do, what you can do here, or what they've chosen to do, is to sample sequentially, sequentially like we did with the LSTMs. So like in a sentence where you, um, you can produce in one go an output over all the wor uh, a probability distribution over all the words in the sentence. Um, but when you actually want to produce a sentence, it helps to then sample over that from left to right. To first sample the first word and then sample the second word knowing what the first word is. Because that helps you create a more coherent sen uh, sentence. And the same works in this action space. So let's say you have three actions. You get a probability distribution for every particular action dimension. Uh, you sample the first, and you feed that to your network and your current state. And then given that information, you run through your network again, and then you sample the second action. And then you do the same with the third action. Uh, that's a kind of autoregressive uh, policy head, they call it. So that's sort of roughly what I imagine the network to look like. Uh, then they train in uh, what they call multi-agent learning. Uh, so they um, basically they create a league of a number of players. And they freeze the strongest players in the league. So they don't train anymore and branch off some new players and uh, retrain those in a sort of, uh, keep training in a sort of tournament style. Um, and the idea here is that if you have a pool of players training against each other, they might all sort of converge to a particular space of your uh, particular model space where they can all beat each other and they all get very good in that particular part of the model space. But there might actually be over here some model that you've forgotten about that can actually beat all of them. Because you're only looking at the models you're evolving, you're sort of, you don't get the variance to, uh, to be guarded against all the stuff that you've forgotten about, the simple 
simple tricks that you've forgotten about. So you sort of retain them in your league and freeze them so that all these models, while they're training, they're also still playing against these older models and they're not forgetting to beat these early, uh, early easy strategies. And then out of that comes a mixture of about five players that together are uh, uh, played against, uh, against uh, the human. Um, so then the question is, uh, does Alpha Star, uh, when it beat these players, did it actually, does it actually show human performance, or does it exploit things that humans can't do in StarCraft? Which is an open question. It's, uh, you can go on the internet and there's uh, lots and lots of debate about this. So basically, first, uh, the first issue is the global camera. So as you can see here, Alpha Star sees the whole board at once. And if you've played StarCraft, then you know one of the sort of slightly annoying things about StarCraft is that you constantly have to move your camera around to put attention on one part of the map. Um, and Alpha Star doesn't have to do that. So the response by DeepMind here is that Alpha Star doesn't have to do it, but it still actually works out a kind of attention mechanism. So it still usually is only playing, paying attention to one part of the map even though it can't see whole, the whole of the map at once. But then some of the people who understand StarCraft properly, they have pointed out that some of the things it does, some of the ways it responds to sort of sneak attacks and sudden attacks, are much more quick and much faster than a human being could do. So it, it does seem to derive some advantage from seeing the whole map at once that a human doesn't have. And the second part, second uh, controversial issue is the number of actions per minute the number of things you can tell your units to do per minute, which of course for humans is limited, the number of times you can click a mouse is limited. It's astonishingly high for these high level players, it's about 800 times, but it's still limited. Um, it's also capped for Alpha Star to about 600. Um, but the issue here is that human players, when they reach this peak of, of 800 clicks a minute, a lot of that is sort of noise. A lot of that isn't very good or very specific and very important. Whereas Alpha Star can actually, it might be capped at around 600 actions per minute, but those 600 actions can all be incredibly high quality. So there might still be a huge amount of uh, value that Alpha Star is getting from doing what's called micro, so micromanagement at a much higher level than a human being can do without actually uh, uh, being better at the high-level strategy and the cognition and the intelligence, which is what we're actually after. Uh, so one final point that's uh, mentioned in the uh, commentary, which is that um, during one of the final games where they actually uh, allowed this mana guy to uh, play a version of the Alpha Star that did have to move the camera, so they did make a version that had to do that as well, and it played slightly worse but not that much worse. But one thing that was observable was that uh, this um, mana, this player, he tried a particular strategy where you have a, a, a flying unit just outside of view of the base of the opponent. And occasionally it flies into your base and starts attacking people until you realize what's happening. You send out your, your armies to intercept and then you fly away again to safety, right? And then uh, once your opponent thinks, oh, that's over now, he moves his armies back, you do that again and you do that again. And you can sort of keep harassing him and he keeps moving his armies and it's, you keep moving away again. And the thing they saw here, and that I think is very important to see what's go, uh, where Alpha Star is at this level, is that Alpha Star kept doing that. The trick kept working. So Mana kept getting some benefit from this, kept harassing, and Alpha Star kept moving his armies towards this uh, plane and then moving his armies back again. So once Mana had found an exploitable trick, Alpha Star kept falling for it again and again. Because the way Alpha Star updates its strategies and learns to, uh, to not fall for these strategies is in this player pool, during this learning pool. After that, its strategies are fixed. So if it encounters a new strategy within the game, it has, as far as I can tell, no way to respond to that. And that, I think, is one of the core weaknesses of Alpha Star that we're seeing now, which hopefully means that humans will still for a long time, or for, for some time, be better than computers at, 
StarCraft so that we can uh, study this problem with a little bit more. Uh, yeah, this, we'll study this problem a little bit more, and then it will hopefully give us some more insight into cognition, because ultimately that's what it's all about. So that's uh, so. I overran again. Sorry. I'll uh, try a little bit better to avoid that next time when we will talk about. Um, we'll have a review of the whole course so far.